Um, Sarah is a lecturer in organisational behaviour at Sheffield University Management School. Um, her research focuses on understanding how employees can be better supported to speak up about the things that they're not happy with in the workplace. She's also an accredited professional coach, helping professional females to find their authentic voice. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Anna. You've done my introduction now, so that saves the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all I'd like to add to um, what Anna said here is that before I joined academia in 2012, where I went to do my PhD, I was a management consultant and an operations manager. So in the work that I do, I bring industry experience, I bring academic research and I bring my coaching skills. Um, so you, you might see elements of all of those then throughout my presentation. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you lots of things to think about. Um, so I really hope that happens. And I'm also aware that we've got breakout groups and I, I really want to get you thinking about things and thinking about what we can do. And particularly thinking about the challenge um, that Maureen and Kristen have laid down, which is about start speaking out about it, is, is to really think about how possible is that and how can we make it work? So the big question then is what works and what doesn't work when it comes to creating workplace environments where everyone feels safe to speak up? And what I'm going to do is introduce you very quickly to some literature which will start to answer that question. First of all, I want to point out that the literature thinks of voice very, very specifically, and I think possibly differently actually to the way that Maureen and Christine think about it more broadly. So the literature I'm gonna share with you today talks about dissatisfied employees. So employee, employees who are half unhappy with something that's happened in the workplace, and it requires them to tell a manager or somebody in a, a position of authority so they can do something about it. So that's particularly the frame of reference that this literature talks about. It doesn't talk about, and it doesn't refer to people sharing things with friends or family or talking to colleagues about it. It's very specifically talking to a manager, expecting them to do something about it. So there's five influences that shape voice in the workplace that are relevant for um, sexual harassment and appropriate behavior. So the first one is the individual and our individual um, propensity really to speak up in the workplace. And then we've got what happens to individuals when they're in a group. And I think we all know, don't we, that individuals don't necessarily do what they want to do when they're in a group of people. So employees do behave differently collectively to individuals. We've also got then managers who make up a large part of organizations most of the time. We've got content. So what you want to talk about really does make a difference and context. And I think context really is everything else. Um, it's the bigger picture as to what else is going on for the people, for the organization, or even in the world at the time that that voice is trying to take place. So the content, we as humans, generally do not like to talk about bad news. We don't like to challenge people's views or opinions or have different views or opinions. We don't like to talk about sexual harassment and mistreatment. And two studies that have been done uh, 10 years apart, uh, employees were asked how often they had remained silent about something that they thought a manager should know about. And that ranged between 68% and 85%. So we know that employees remaining silent about things that managers might want to know is really high. The reason being they, uh, that fear is a really large part of the driving behavior about why people don't voice. And it can be about ruining our reputation or image. So maybe um, being labeled a telltale it can be about damaging relationships, maybe with colleagues or maybe with a manager. We can be scared of negative work evaluation, so bad appraisals or missing a promotion or being given a really bad project opportunity to work on. We might be worried that people will retaliate or 
uh, what we've said or will they ostracize us? And I think anybody who's had negative self-esteem or poor mental health or really been feeling down in the dumps is, is really uh, keen not to go there voluntarily. And I think when we're scared of all these things, actually what we do is we protect ourselves and say it's easier if I don't speak out. When we think about individuals, right, there's absolutely tons of research about individual differences. So the ways that we are all different and our preferences for how we do things at work. And there's loads of research to show how these variables make a difference to voice. Uh, and, and I'm not gonna go through them because there are loads of them. But ultimately, um, when we, so we're all different as people, but when we come together, what happens is we've got this effect called spirals of silence, which is where individually we would be unlikely to speak out where we perceived a majority opinion. And the important thing there really is about the perception because people don't often speak to each other. So it is just a view that actually my view is different to everyone else's. And the more people remain silent, the more that perception of majority view becomes more dominant. And, and there are cases where that hasn't been the case. It literally is a perception, it really isn't the reality. But the risk of that is minority groups are at more risk of bullying or abuse, and they're less able to speak out because they just can't voice what they need to do, what they need to talk about. Managers. So managers create cultures in organizations, and there is a culture called organizational silence, which is where employees are less likely to voice silence is their option that they would choose and this culture can be created largely because managers don't tend to ask opinions of their employees before proceeding and one of the reasons for that is that many managers believe that employees are self-interested so they're not capable of giving an objective viewpoint that's maybe balanced between what would be good for the team and the organization and what would be good for themselves they're just focused on what's good for themselves there's also a view that managers know best they get paid more they may be more highly qualified they've maybe worked there longer so actually what point would there be in asking people who are less senior than me in the organization and there's also a belief that when everyone agrees it's better than when people disagree now we, we know that for creativity and innovation in organizations, there needs to be different opinions and perspectives, but managers find that problematic, it feels uncomfortable for them. And so they tend to go towards making sure that everybody agrees. Context. Um, so like I said, context is everything else that's going on. The one big thing that's always going on in organizations is power differences between employees and managers. So we can say that all voice and silence is underpinned by power. And managers have an ability to empower their employees by being interested in what they've got to say, by giving them the opportunity to contribute to decisions, by giving them a voice. But on the same, by the same token, they also have the ability to disempower them by not listening to them, not inviting them, and not feeling what they have to say is important. What we also know as a general rule, which kind of supports this statement is, people in lower power positions in an organization, so those towards the bottom of an organization are less likely to voice. And we also know that people who are more senior in an organization are more likely to voice. So that's a kind of general rule. And I thought that was interesting to, you know, to talk about because the thing about gender is the voice and silence literature, which is about 20 years old now, uh, in its early days, tried to see what the differences were between male and female. And it simply looked at whether it was a male or female that they were interviewing or was taking part in the study. And what they found was there was no difference. So from that early point, gender has never really been a focus of the voice and silence literature. So we know only a really little bit about it. But I'm gonna tell you some of the things that I think are relevant. Um, 
there doesn't appear to be any obvious differences between genders because of their gender in particular. And we kind of knew that, but in 2021, so a few months ago, a paper has been published here that, that explicitly looked at that and said, you can't tell what the difference would be just by someone's gender. It is far more complex than that. So what we could say here, for example, is a female is not less likely to talk about a problem than a male in general, but a female might be less likely to speak up to a male about sexual harassment, for example. So the, the research now needs to be focused on more nuanced differences, such as the way that we were brought up, um, the way that males and females or different genders are socialized to normalize behaviors and what's acceptable, what our personal belief systems are that we're brought up with, and again, about the context, what else is going on in the world? And I think it's really important that we just refer to Me Too, because there was something very different going on in the world at the time uh, when Me Too started to take off. And I think that was what helped people to contribute towards that and start to voice. So we, you know, we have to always think about is the context the same? So this paper that was published a few months ago, what they found here was that where people perceive gender inequality, they're less li likely to voice. So again, it doesn't matter what gender, if they feel like they are being discriminated against, they're less likely to voice. Females reported having less influence in male-dominated industries. Again, so this meant that because they've less influence, they were less likely to voice. Females voiced less when they were lower down the hierarchy which we've already seen to be a general rule. But what was really surprising, I thought, was women are nervous of voicing even in female dominated industries. And I think before what we were thinking, especially with the spirals of silence, is where females are in the majority, they're more likely to voice. And actually what we found is that's not necessarily the case. So there's definitely something deeper going on there that needs more research. And found that rather than voice women are more likely to take action and so this might be um, taking advantage of employee assistance programs it might be speaking informally to human resources it might be working on their professional development so for example um, learning how to get more confidence or how to be more assertive women would be more likely than men to voice on the whole, but only when a co-worker was the offender of the sexual harassment, not a supervisor. Males and females with low self-esteem are less likely to voice about mistreatment from a supervisor. And you know how I mentioned there about the importance of self-esteem and well-being is that is also really important for voicing. And I think we can all say if we were in a position where we felt we were being discriminated against, we really want to be in the best position to be able to do something about it. So we need to look after our own self-esteem. So what do we actually know right then? So what we know in general here is that people don't like to speak up. That is a general rule. And we know a lot in the literature about the reasons why people don't speak up. We know that being female or male or actually any other gender doesn't make a difference directly. We know it's really hard to compare studies with each other because there has been no sustained track of research in this field at all. So all the studies are slightly different, which makes it really hard to kind of draw general rules. And it's also almost impossible to measure levels of voice and silence in the workplace. So although we can ask people, what's the likelihood of you speaking up or not speaking up? And it seems really high. We don't actually know what that level is. It really is about perception. So I wanted to just leave us here with some thoughts about what we can do differently or what the way forward might look like. From a policy and practice point of view, um, there's a few things here that seem to make a difference. So the use of internal mediation seemed like a, a good way forward. In the study there, it seems that people were more likely to use that as an option. We know that a leadership style of coaching is more likely to encourage people to voice. And of course, coaching is all about helping people to come up with their own perspectives. And um, we know that that makes a big difference to their ability to voice. I think there's more research needed to understand why that would be though. 
women need to plan what they say very carefully. So there is a lot of risk associated with women, regardless of their level in the organization or whether they're a minority or a majority. So there might be something here about providing women with more support to build a plan. I think, again, coaching would be really valuable here in helping people to be able to say what they think. And using evidence and possible solutions might help people to be heard. So they must have evidence and they might want to come up with possible solutions. I personally think that's really realistic to expect people to do that. But it does seem as if that is something managers demand. If you're a manager, what can you do? So we know employee voice is correlated with perceptions of openness and honesty. The more approachable and trustworthy you appear, the more likely people are to tell you things. And this seems to be um, created because of a concept called psychological safety. Many of you may have heard that it is quite trendy at the moment for organisations to want to create psychological safety. And the way that they tend to do that is build individual relationships between managers and their teams. Now, relationship quality is important for voice, but only to a certain point. And because of the power differences between employees and managers, managers always have more influence. They always have more authority. Employees aren't able to forget that. And so relationship building will only go so far for you to encourage people to voice. The reason being, I think here, psychological safety leads to reduced risk. So what it means is it feels less risky, but actually, it's about knowing that the manager is going to do something about it, which leads to increased voice. So that relationship quality, part of that is about mutual trust and respect. And it's absolutely about knowing that that manager is going to do everything they can for you at their level to support you. When, so that's on an individual level. But when we talk about a whole organisation, that would be known as a psychosocial safety climate. And it's evidenced by policy and practice, which is evidenced for everybody. So they can see that the individual or people are prioritized um, or as equal to productivity of the organization. And finally, then, as individuals, I think it's about empowerment because it is all about empower. It's about knowing ourselves, it's about knowing what we stand for, and it's about knowing what difference we want to make in the world. It's about finding a way to do something about it. And uh, it's about having a view as to how we'd like the world to be different so we can start to make that happen.